Four points. Okay, so let's see if the bond is polar. Okay. So we go change in electronegativity equals 4.0 minus 4.0 divided minus 2.1 divided. Okay. That's going to be 1.9 divided. Is that bond polar? Yeah, because it's got a number there, right? If we're going to draw our polarity arrow, we're going to draw it like that, of course. Right? And then we ask ourselves, well, is the whole molecule polar? Yes, it is, because there's only one bond, right? And um, it's polar, okay? So notice the reason this is a nonpolar molecule is because these two <coughs> polarity arrows cancel each other out. One's going exactly this way by 1.1. One's going exactly that way by 1.1. 1 .1. Um, remember, it's a linear molecule. That's why. Uh, this is also a linear molecule, but it's only got the one bond going one way. Let's look at um, water now. Okay. So water, remember it's a bent structure. So oxygen is 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1, like that. And when we figure out the change in electronegativity, that's going to be 1.4. Okay. But it's going to be 1.4 like that, going up that bond. And this one will also be doing the same thing, like that, having the plus region down here and the minus region up here. Okay. Notice again, if we <coughs> add these two arrows up, they uh, add up to overall zero, right? Because they cancel each other out. When we add these two arrows up, it's kind of like a vector addition, right? It's all always going to be pointing up, right? through like that. So that's going to be the addition of those two arrows. Okay? So they're not canceling each other out in this case. They're both pointing up. The negative charge region is here. The positive charge region is here. Okay? Notice we have to draw this in the proper uh, structural formula. Because if we're drawing it like a Lewis structure, say we thought uh, water looked like this, we would be incorrect in the analysis of this because we would say that one arrow would be going that way, the other arrow would be going that way, and they would eventually cancel each other out. Okay? So we have to know that this is a bent structure. Okay? Because if we thought this was linear, we would say this is a nonpolar molecule. When in actuality it's a very polar molecule. Okay? So again, you have to know how to build your Lewis structure. Then you have to do your structural formula, just like we've done here and here, and then um, add those vectors up to see if the whole molecule is polar. Okay? Um, try it with uh, number three on your own. What you'll find is that's a nonpolar molecule. Okay? It's a nonpolar molecule, CH4. And it's again because uh, even though you've got four different bonds that have uh, electronegativity values, uh, they all cancel each other out. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, physical states of ionic and covalent compounds. Okay, so ionic compounds are usually solids at room temperature. Covalent co compounds can be solids, liquids, and gases at room temperature. Of course, uh, covalent molecules, some covalent molecules that we're familiar with are, uh, I don't know, like oxygen, that's a covalent molecule, which is a gas at room temperature. Uh, methane, the stuff that comes out of the Bunsen burner, that's a gas at room temperature. Um, a liquid covalent com compound that we're familiar with at room temperature, maybe uh, water. That's a liquid covalent compound um, at room temperature. 
and a solid covalent compound at room temperature, uh, maybe something like uh, wax or um, like I have a bunch of solid covalent compounds in my skin. You know, they're all solids at room temperature. Um, you know, most of the structures in my body are solids at room temperature and they're all covalent compounds. Ionic compounds just have very, very, very strong bonds. These ionic bonds are very, very strong. So uh, it keeps um, the uh, various ions connected to each other. doesn't allow them to get enough energy to actually break away to form the liquid state or the gaseous state. Okay, So um, ionic compounds are normally, well, I can't really think of any ionic compounds that are not solids at room temperature. So um, that's the difference. Uh, ionic compounds are crystalline. Uh, covalent compounds can be either crystalline or amorphous. Amorphous means that it doesn't have any real regular structure to it. So let's talk about in intermolecular forces. We've really been talking about intramolecular forces this whole time. Um, and that's intramolecular forces are the attractive forces within molecules. Um, those are better known as bonds to us or shared electron pairs. Okay, so chemical bonds are intramolecular forces. Um, these are very, very strong forces. They hold these molecules together without allowing them to break apart. But of course, there's these intermolecular forces as well. Um, for those of you who've uh, done lab, I think we talked a little bit about it uh, this week in lecture. Uh, but these intermolecular forces are the attractive forces between molecules, okay? So when we're looking at And then when you give it more energy, you totally break down those intermolecular forces to where they 
different molecules fly off each other and form uh, steam or gaseous flow. So again, uh, inter intramolecular forces are attractive forces within molecules. Intermolecular forces are attractive forces between molecules. And these intermolecular forces determine many of the physical properties. Um, they're a direct consequence of the intramolecular forces in these molecules. Of course, remember, because this bond is polar, right, this bond is polar, overall the molecule is polar, okay? So because the molecule is polar, it likes to attract another molecule. So it's because of these things that these things are uh, made, okay? Because of the bonds that the intermolecular forces arise. Okay, so let's talk about solubility. Solubility is just the ability of something to dissolve into something else, okay? So if I say sugar is soluble in water, it means that sugar is able to be dissolved into water, okay? So uh, solubility, the definition is the maximum amount of solute. In the case that I gave you, uh, the sugar water example, maxim that uh, allows you to remember uh, what, dissolve in, what dissolves in what is like dissolves like. So polar compounds dissolve other polar compounds. Nonpolar compounds dissolve nonpolar compounds. Okay? So that's why sugar is soluble in water. So water is polar, right? So sugar must also be polar. So anything that dissolves in water has to be polar, because water is polar. Okay, so polar molecules are more soluble in polar solvents. Nonpolar molecules are more soluble in nonpolar solvents. So we got to ask ourselves, will ammonia dissolve in water? We could figure that out on our own uh, by taking the electronegativity uh, differences of nitrogen and hydrogen and looking at the particular structure of ammonia, what you would do is figure out, if you did that, figure out that ammonia itself was polar, water is polar, so would you expect them to dissolve into each other? Yep, because most, both molecules are polar. So has anybody ever uh, gone down the grocery aisle and uh, gone down the like dressing aisle saw um, Italian dressing that was kind of separated, right? So uh, what you'll find is, especially with Italian dressing or the other types of things, um, is that you, when you look at them on the shelf, they kind of have two different layers, if you will, and you got to shake it up and before you put it on your salad or you'll get all the, the oil out first, right? And it kind of tastes gross, right? But it, if you shake it all up, it tastes really good, right? It's because uh, of the difference in polarity between uh, water, which is the main component of the stuff on the bottom, and oil, which is the main component of the stuff on the top. Oil is nonpolar, okay? Which is why it does not dissolve in the water, um, in the water layer. It only sits above it. In fact, oil is less dense than water, too, which is why it's sitting on top of the water layer. So let's go to this slide now. What do you know about oil and water? Well, they don't mix. Why? Because water is polar, of course. OK, get it into your head that water is polar, because water is like one of it's the what's called the universal solvent. OK, 
So like it's going to be the solvent for most of the solutions that you have ever, ever think about in your chemistry career and in your chosen life career. Okay, so you want to get it in your head that po water is polar. In fact, all the things about water you really want to start kind of memorizing because it'll really help you out later. But anyway, um, since they don't mix, oil must be nonpolar. The water molecules exert their attractive forces on other water molecules. So, kind of like what they're doing here, right? And when the oil, oil molecule wants to get in between there, the water molecules say no way and squish it out, right? So, what it does is it creates this layer of oil right on top of the layer of water. And the oil molecules, they're kind of these long, like, stringy things that like to lay on top of each other. So they like to interact with each other, too. So the oil remains insoluble in water and floats on the surface of water as it floats in. If you put nonpolar stuff into the oil-water mixture, it would dissolve into the oil part and not the water part, of course. Okay, so let's go back to that interaction of ammonia and water question. You see, just like we've drawn up here about um, uh, just or looking at just a solution of water, right, up here, you can see the same kind of thing happens when you dissolve ammonia into water. Okay, ammonia, of course, looks like this. Everybody probably knows by now. Right? So this is your delta positive region. If you were to do your electronegativity values, you would figure this out. Here, this is your delta positive region. This is your delta negative region. Just like with water here. Okay? So uh, when you get this thing interacting with this thing, you get the same sort of little dashed inter intramolecular, intermolecular um, attractions. Uh, those attractions are actually known as hydrogen bonds. Okay, but that's how water, or that's how ammonia dissolves into water. It kind of is attracted to the water molecules and kind of fits in to the water matrix. So if we had an ammonia molecule, it could kind of squeeze into a little space that one of the water molecules previously occupied. Um, so solutions of ionic compounds. Let's talk about ionic compounds now. This is all covalent compounds. Um, Ionic compounds, of course, are made up of ions as opposed to molecules, which covalent molecules or covalent compounds are made out of, are made up of. Um, so let's look at a particular um, ionic compound that most of you should have known for the test, although I was quite surprised that some of you didn't. Um, sodium chloride. When we put this sodium chloride into water, okay, so we can think of it adding it to water like that, okay, what we're really saying is we're going to dissolve this into water. So you can imagine we've got water, we've got our little salt shaker. place, okay? They're 
they're not like closely stuck together like they were in solid form. They're just free floating. And when when uh, ionic compound breaks down in water to its ions and the ions become free floating, we call these electrolytes. Okay, these ions, this free flowing solution, it's an electrolyte solution. We call it electrolytes because now the solution is able to conduct electricity. Okay, because the ions actually have charges and they allow the electrons to jump from ion to ion to ion. And of course, electricity is just a bunch of electrons flowing through water. Okay. So this process of going from the solid compound to its ions here in solution, this process is known as dissociation. Okay, so when the ions dissociate, we call them electrolytes. The covalent compounds, due to the fact that they're not made up of ions, right? So the difference, remember the difference between ionic and covalent compounds.
which has a much higher molecular weight. Okay, and I can't think of it off my head, but it's um, around 60 something. Okay, so uh, if you just think about those two relative numbers, 20 to 60, you and you've just thought about them on molecular weight uh, standards, you would expect that maybe butane would be three times a, as high a boiling point as water would be, right? Because the molecular weight of butane is three times as high as the molecular weight of water. But of course, that's not the case for anyone who's used like a cigarette lighter um, knows, right? If you push the button, no liquid comes out of the thing, right? It's because butane's a gas at room temperature. Well, why is that a gas? Why is it a gas at room temperature if it's got such a high molecular weight? It's because it's a nonpolar molecule, okay? Water is a very, very polar molecule, which gives it such a high boiling point relative to its size, okay? Water's uh, boiling point is 100 degrees, which is very, 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 very high, 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and the boiling point of butane, something that's about three times as heavy as water, is, I think, negative uh, 12 degrees Celsius. Okay, so there's quite a dramatic difference, okay, between, uh, you know, uh, polar and nonpolar molecules uh, with respect to their boiling or melting points. Okay? Um, okay, so here's some definitions that we've talked about most of this stuff. But melting point is the temperature at which a solid is converted to a liquid. Boiling point is the temperature at which the liquid is converted to a gas. Ionic compounds, of course, have much higher melting and boiling points than covalent compounds. You can think of ionic compounds being uh, very the most polar things that there are. Okay, that's why they've got such high uh, melting points and boiling points. Okay. Um, a large amount of uh, energy is required to break this electrostatic interaction. And what you'll find is the melting points of these types of compounds are about uh, 800 to 2,000 degrees Celsius, okay? So it's very high relative to like something that's just polar, like water, its melting point, remember, is zero degrees Celsius. So about 1,000 <coughs> degrees less than something that's ionic. Okay, so it goes from ionic to polar to nonpolar, right? So ionic is very high at mo melting point. Polar is semi-high and nonpolar is not high at all. Uh, so again, like we just discussed, energy is needed to break these intermolecular forces. Remember, energy and temperature are the same thing. So we've discussed this many times to where if I say I'm just cranking the temperature up, that just means I'm just giving the molecules more energy, okay? So that's what you're actually doing if you raise the temperature of something. So um, since energy is needed to overcome these intermolecular attractive forces, uh, the greater the intermolecular force, of course, the more energy would be required, right? That makes sense, right? <laughs> like everybody. Uh, higher melting point of a solid, higher boiling point of a liquid, okay? Will result from this. Okay, and here you can think of the comparison between ionic and covalent compounds. So composed of what they're composed of, what the electrons do, transferred or shared, their physical states, um, do they dissociate in solution, do they have high boiling points and melting points. Okay. So, <coughs> ionic and covalent bonds only re represent two of the forces that occur between atomic sized particles and hold these ah. particles together to form matter that's familiar to us. There are other forces, of course, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. Metallic bonding, dipolar forces, hydrogen bonding, and dispersion forces. Um, all of these things, these three at the bottom, are essentially almost the same thing, okay? They're just uh, different um, strengths of intermolecular forces. So they're all these intermolecular forces here, just um, 
Well, uh, you're ranking them relative to not very strong, medium strong, very strong, with hydrogen bonding being the most strong out of those three. Okay. So, <coughs> um, yeah, we know ionic compounds are held together by ionic bonds. Polar compounds are held together, um, held together by this, they mean trying to interact with each other. That's what they mean by held together. Um, so they're held together by what we call these dipolar forces. Okay, so why are they called that? Di, remember, means two, right? Two. So polar means, you know, the phenomenon of having a plus and a minus charge on you, or a partial plus and a partial minus. So a dipolar would be something that's like the delta minus interacting with the delta plus of something else. Okay, so that's a dipolar force. Those are what holds these uh, molecules together like kind of not like that. Uh, so, so there are a few different types of dipolar forces. One of them we've learned about already, this hydrogen bonding, okay. and this occurs, this dipolar force, hydrogen bonding, occurs between so high. That's what causes it to be so high. Then we got these things called network solids that are like diamonds. So if you're a married woman or whatever, you can look at your finger and see something that's a network solid, or this is the structure of a diamond. Uh, it's just a bunch of covalent bonds to uh, various of the same atoms. Uh, I think this actually is graphite that is shown here. Graphite's almost the same thing as diamond except it's sheets. So the stuff that you write with in your pencil is the same thing as diamond. It's just sheets of carbon as opposed to kind of all connected in a 109.5 degree array. You know, So that's the, the difference between those two structures, uh, but they give quite uh, different um, results macromolecularly. So you're interested. But anyway, silicon dioxide, which is sand, is bonded the exact same way. Um, so there's a few of these that are uh, kind of these big covalent molecules. So like this is kind of a big covalent molecule. That's what we call a network solid. Um, Nonpolar covalent molecules are held together by these things called dispersion forces. Uh, and these are really induced dipoles. I know, we're almost out of here. This is a bad one, right? <laughs> these, are, these are induced dipoles, okay? Because, of course, nonpolar <coughs> molecules don't have any polar regions, right? So if you want to think of a nonpolar molecule, it does have, so just pretend this hot dog thing is a nonpolar molecule. Um, it does have electrons, remember, 
remember, flowing around on the outside of it. Okay? These electrons, they don't like to be next to other electrons. Okay? But nonpolar molecules like to interact with other nonpolar molecules. So what happens is when two of these nonpolar molecules get kind of close to each other, the electrons from this one feel the electrons from this one, and they kind of get away from it. Okay? So these guys get away. Say they're concentrated over here at one point in time. So that would mean that this part is more positive. Okay? Since this part is more positive, this guy makes his electrons stick right there, concentrated. Okay? And uh, this is very, very transient uh, interaction. Okay? So it happens just very, very quickly, 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 quickly. Right? But um, it does give a weak kind of attraction to these two molecules. Okay? So this running around of electrons and making them concentrate somewhere else, this is called an induced dipole because this one induces this one to do it. Okay? So this is called uh, dispersion forces or induced dipole. This is just a bunch of copper atoms kind of stuck together. And uh, those atoms are stuck together in kind of just what we call a sea of electrons. So there's all these electrons around them, and they're just kind of floating in this sea of electrons, if you will. Okay. And then if you look at uh, this graph, you can see the increasing strength of intermolecular forces. Um, Notice uh, which ones are stronger, which ones are not strong. Notice the dispersion forces at the bottom are only um, nonpolar molecules. And then there's some selected melting points and boiling points by compound type. This should really emphasize all the stuff we've talked about today. Um, uh, the melting points and boiling points of nonpolar stuff is much lower than polar stuff. 